We're here today to uh, talk about what's wrong with Congress and what to do about it. And I must say that I've gotten dozens of emails saying my timing is great, and I'm sorry my timing is great. I knew it would be a conflict over the budget, but I didn't realize we'd end up shutting down government. We're here to uh, hear Tom Mann and Orm Ornstein, and they have a, a new edition of It's Even Worse Than It Looks, uh, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Poli Politics of Extremism. The new edition came out on September 3rd, and related to that, there was an excellent op-ed piece in the Washington Post outlining some of their uh, solutions, but also some of the problems. What I'd like to do at the very beginning here is just welcome Tom and Norm back to the campus. They're like part of the family. Norm's my neighbor. Uh, he used to be my boss on the Senate Committee on Committees, and that's why the committee system is working so well in the Senate these days, because we did a great job. Uh, and Tom is taught here. We've team taught a course on survey research together. I don't know if you can remember that. Right? Uh, one of the students in that class is now a professor in the School of Public Affairs, by the way. Uh -huh. And so you did well, Tom. Wow. But both of them he have been here on campus to talk about a variety of, of topics related to their publications, which are outlined in the handout for you. I will not go through all of them because it would take the entire time of the session if I went through all of them. But they really are uh, unique academic slash practitioners in the sense that they've been here in Washington, involved uh, in Washington, but from that it educates them uh, about uh, what's going on and it gives them great access for interviews and observations and that is related to this book uh, here as well as many of their other works. What I'd like to do is, is uh, first of all, how many of you have purchased this book and read it? Good, you've read it too. Uh, how many of you have market out there, Norm. <laughs> how many of you have purchased this book for all of your relatives uh, <laughs> and your neighbors and friends? I encourage you to do it. It's a great book. Uh, it really is. Uh, and it outlines problems, which I'm going to summarize very quickly, and it outlines some solutions to those problems. And so what we're going to do is engage uh, Tom and Norm in discussing some solutions from the book, but beyond the book there are solutions that have been discussed. They, they think some of those solutions are not very good, and I'd like you to address that also uh, in terms of uh, easy fixes for our problem. Well, the problem is facing us right now, government shutdown. It's a manufactured crisis uh, to impose policy preferences by the Republicans, Tom and Norm say. I happen to agree with that. Uh, every time the debt limit comes up in 2011, it was a similar situation. Then it was sort of hostage taking of the full faith and credit of the United States and the first ever downgrade of the U.S. securities. I mention this because if it happens again, uh, the markets will react. Uh, you will lose part of your portfolio, but also uh, there may be an international uh, crisis in terms of uh, our uh, situation with our debt. Uh, behind this uh, is really a shattered uh, budget process, which they detail. Just to let you know, the budget process and the uh, concurrent budget resolution has only been passed four times since 1976. We're delayed in not only that, but appropriations. We've got too many omnibus bills, growing numbers of, uh, of CRs. Uh, we have, therefore, uh, historic low levels of public approval of the, of the Congress. Uh, we hit 10 percent this week of those who say it's good uh, or it's doing a good or outstanding job. Now, I've never met one of the 10 percent. Is there anybody in here that said it's doing a good or outstanding? I don't think so. So it's, it's range. It, it shot up to 19 percent when they thought they were going to consider the Syrian uh, resolution and then it went back down to 10 percent. But behind all of this uh, is what Tom and Norm write about in terms of the extreme partisanship uh, uh, on the Hill. They call it asymmetric partisanship. It's controversial in the press because the press uh, needs to look like it's even-handed. 
it needs to look like it uh, is even-handed in terms of its discussion of the Democrats uh, and the Republicans and the President in this process. They argue that this uh, entire thing is not only because we have a missing middle, but we have asymmetric partisanship. Moderate Republicans are gone. The far right, uh, the uh, Tea Party people, the numbers range from 30 to 60, are holding the speaker and the entire process in America hostage. Um, it's really, they argue, an insurgent Republican Party from the from the far left uh, that's taken over things. And related to it is partisan redistricting abuse. Related to it is the missing middle, few competitive districts. Related to this is uh, a uh, problem with the media. They criticize the media. They say the media misses the story, taking the p path of, quote, artificial balance and sterile neutrality. Now, we've got a lot of people that are uh, communications majors, some people in the media here. I, I love that quote. Uh, they don't cover it uh, correctly, Tom and Norm say. There's been a disappearance of the regular order in the legislative process, extraordinary procedural maneuvers, a problem with the filibuster holds, excessive amendments. Um, there's a problem of the Tuesday Thursday Club. They were in, in session in 2011, less than 100 days. Uh, and there's a problem with, of course, campaign finance and the amount of money flowing in uh, to members when they, when they are running for office, which takes them out of Washington. Uh, there are many other problems. Too many committees and subcommittees. There's a problem with ethics. There's a problem with uh, uh, a, uh, the close linkage with specialized interests with some of them. But what we're going to do now is uh, talk about what are the prospects for change? How will it change? What do you recommend for the change? They recommend a different Republican Party. How, how can that happen uh, when we have redistricting to SAFE? Um, they recommend improving the lawmaking process. Uh, they discuss reform of the filibuster. Uh, and uh, forthright commentary by the media. But I would like to hear in greater detail from both of them, starting with Norm, if that's all right, Norm, uh, on the on the far right, uh, no, on the left, I guess, in the audience, uh, and then we'll go to Tom. Thanks. You can do it from there or here or whatever. Okay. Um, 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 well, first, I, uh, I want to thank, on behalf of Tom as well, uh, you, Jim, uh, for uh, having this forum, but also for all the work you do at your center, which is really uh, a centerpiece of uh, the study of uh, our important institutions here. Um, and I also uh, want to acknowledge uh, that we have uh, two uh, real giants uh, of uh, the public policy world uh, here in uh, uh, Dwight Inc. and Brad Patterson, uh, which is really uh, flattering to us that they both uh, come out along with all the rest of you. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for uh, mentioning the book and uh, that it does make a great holiday gift. And uh, Hanukkah is early this year. Uh, there's many, many other holidays uh, for which it, uh, which it would work. Yeah. Uh, I did want to uh, make just one little note. Uh, that you, the, you're right, Jim, that there are 10% who approve of what's going on, but we've dug a little bit further, and it turns out that 97% of that 10% uh, think that uh, Ted Cruz did his best work in the Mission Impossible series. So, uh, um, it's been an interesting uh, week, of course, and an interesting couple of days. Yesterday, the President called in uh, Mitch McConnell, John Boehner, and the Democratic leaders, and they had a conversation for an hour. After it was over, Boehner came out and said he was quite disappointed. Uh, the President had uh, accused uh, Boehner and his uh, colleagues of uh, holding the entire country hostage, and Boehner said that's just uh, so wrong, it's clear the President didn't read our ransom note. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, our book is uh, out now with a new edition that has uh, a preface and an afterword that uh, brings it up through the election. We are kicking ourselves that we didn't uh, retitle this one. It's even worse than it was. Uh, and 
a new version might have to be run for your lives. And it does reflect the reality that uh, a very difficult situation that we saw, and one where we had just a tiny glimmer of hope in the aftermath of uh, a pretty sweeping election, uh, might turn around a little bit. Because let's face it, a good part of the problem that we have, uh, although not uh, by any means all of it, is the dynamic of the permanent campaign. Um, that it's all campaigning all the time and in an era where majorities can shift uh, plausibly with almost every election um, and where the differences between the parties are so stark, the incentives to work with those on the other side disappear. Um, and it was embodied, uh, of course, in Mitch McConnell's famous statement multiple times uh, over the first Obama term that his number one goal was to make Barack Obama a one-term president. So after the election, I mused that uh, if his number one goal now was to make Barack Obama a two-term president, mission accomplished, and uh, maybe now at least we could have a brief period of governing, uh, it would be fairly brief because we were moving uh, into the next cycle. And of course, we knew that uh, the midterm elections coming up uh, were ones in which the Republicans uh, would have great hopes of recapturing their majority in the Senate with more Democratic seats up uh, than Republican ones, and that was going to be a problem. And we had a little bit of hope uh, with the fact that we at least resolved the fiscal cliff issues uh, if on the brink of uh, uh, failure at the 11th hour uh, and uh, the end of December. And then we had uh, passage by bar bipartisan majorities, wide ones of aid to Hurricane Sandy and the Violence Against Women's Act, uh, that maybe there were opportunities. And of course, the president had uh, what's been called the Diners Club, the series of uh, dinner meetings with Republican senators, some of whom had just gotten reelected and were in a problem-solving mood, like Bob Corker, that maybe we could make headway on the uh, broader issues uh, of uh, uh, taxes, of uh, uh, spending, and uh, big programs in the government and stabilize the debt at a lower level. And then, of course, we could p potentially move on infrastructure and many other things. That was our fantasy that Tom and I wrote about in the Washington Post Outlook section. Um, but uh, like most of our fantasies, they were not fulfilled. Um, and uh, now it's gotten worse. I want to just say a couple of things about why we are where we are and then turn to the larger subject that Jim had. And it's not repeating what uh, he so nicely laid out uh, as the structure of the book, wh which I should say fundamentally is not only do we have uh, parliamentary style parties now in a system that simply can't accommodate them, but this is more than a problem of partisan and ideological polarization. It's tribalism. Uh, tribalism, which is becoming sectarianism even out in the country and certainly in a lot of states, but tribalism is where your basic approach is if you're for it, I'm against it, even though I was for it yesterday. And we offer a number of examples of that. What's most striking, and it is obviously relevant now, is the way that attitude has uh, affected uh, health reform. The Affordable Care Act, which is called Obamacare, which could just as easily be called Romney Care, but even more, Hatch Care, uh, and uh, Grassley care and Durenberger care uh, and Chafee care because the fundamental structure of the Affordable Care Act came from the Republican alternative crafted by those individuals in 1993-94. And right up until and through much of 2008, if you had talked to Senators Grassley or Hatch, they would have given you a resounding defense of the idea of an individual mandate of moving people onto exchanges where the private marketplace could take over with premium support for those who couldn't afford it. But it became, if he's for it, we're against it. But even worse than that, it's now socialism leading us towards communism, and it has to be uh, attacked by every means necessary. And it's become so obsessive that it just almost can't be described, and that includes people who know much better. I was particularly struck just a week or 10 days ago uh, when uh, Judd Gregg, a very smart, 
guy who was a good legislator, former uh, senator from New Hampshire, wrote an op-ed excoriating the Republican Party for this crazy approach of threatening to shut down the government to uh, defund Obamacare, but then throwing in an obligatory, but of course we all share the goal of eliminating Obamacare, which is heading down the path to a single-payer system. No public option, private insurers, it's become a kind of a catechism that you almost have to recite if you are going to have any credibility at all. And that's a reflection of how far off base our system has gotten and why these solutions become more difficult because it's cultural now and it's shaped as much by outside forces as it is by anything inside. And while we will talk about potential solutions and ways in which we can try to reshape the culture but also eliminate some of the worst pathologies of this process, there is no panacea, there are no easy possibilities. I do want to reflect on a couple of things that have brought us to where we are now. It is very clear, first of all, that the, uh, well, one, there are no more moderates or liberals in the Republican Party. People that we knew well and worked closely with, uh, who used to be called gypsy moths, uh, in contrast to the bull weevil Democrats, uh, because they were primarily from the Northeast, and uh, that was the name uh, about, of that bug that infects hardwood trees primarily here. We're now talking about uh, two kinds of Republicans, no longer moderates and conservatives, it's conservatives and radicals. But the conservatives, who were ruthlessly pragmatic, devised a strategy in 2008 that they crystallized on inaugural eve in 2009 that was uh, an amplification of the approach that Newt Gingrich and his colleagues had applied to Bill Clinton in 1993, which was to behave like a parliamentary minority, unify to oppose everything, no matter what it was that the president pushed, kill much of it, and what you can't kill, make look so ugly and rancorous in a vitriolic struggle that people will be turned off by them, and if they pass, act to delegitimize them. It worked like a charm in 1994, bringing in Republican majorities for the first time in 40 years in the House and in the Senate. It worked with even bigger charm in 2010, bringing in 63 new Republicans in the House and dramatic changes, including at the state level. And we know from what Robert Draper documented about a uh, now famous dinner held at the caucus room on inaugural eve, which included Eric Cantor, Paul Ryan, uh, John Kyle, uh, Newt Gingrich, and others, that this was an explicit strategy. We know when the stimulus package came up that uh, Dave Obey, the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, immediately called in his counterpart, Jerry Lewis, the Republican from uh, California, and said, uh, Jerry, we're going to do a stimulus. The economy is still flat on its back. We want to work with you. Tell us what you would like to see in this package. Go back to your leaders and your rank and file members. And just as importantly, tell us what you would absolutely not want. And we'll work it out. And Lewis laughed and said, uh, Dave, I'm sorry. I've got orders from on high. We are not going to cooperate. Now, we have smoking guns all over the place here about how this operated. Now that's important, but just as important is there was another element of this strategy as the 2010 election approached, which was to encourage and use the anger, the deep populist anger that existed out there on the right, as it did on the left, that began long before Barack Obama's election, indeed was particularly explosive in the fall of 2008 with the bailout a reaction against government and Wall Street, and the idea that that could be exploited in districts out there, recruiting candidates who would exploit it, and then taking that anger and using it to sweep people into office, was taken up by the young guns, Eric Cantor, Paul Ryan, uh, and Kevin McCarthy. They recruited candidates. And the main vehicle they wanted to use was to get all of these candidates out there saying, elect us and we will not increase the debt ceiling because that's the embodiment of government run out of control. Now, one, they knew that that was 
uh, demagogic. They knew that the debt ceiling, uh, when it's raised, reflects paying for past debts. They knew that we had never really threatened the full faith and credit of the United States. But they also knew that it was a winning political argument. And behind it was a belief that, even if Barack Obama held the White House, that he would not allow the debt limit to be breached and default to occur. And so they could use it as leverage to gain what they could not gain in the presidential contest. And that played itself out through the debacle in 2011, where Mitch McConnell did swoop in and we finally got a deal. It was the deal that gave us the super committee uh, that was supposed to be the Avengers emerging in political life uh, with no black widow, uh, but uh, it appeared nobody who could pull the forces together anyhow and then gave us the sequester. Uh, but now we're in a different situation because we're seeing the same thing happen again and the same threat used again. But in 2011, you'd followed the 2010 midterm elections where Republicans had won a big victory, had legitimacy, had uh, one branch uh, of uh, uh, government, and had some leverage. And you had an economy that was still floundering, so any threat uh, of default could have sent the globe into uh, depression. And you had a president concerned about re-election. Now you've had an election which went dramatically the other way at all levels. And you have uh, a president who's not running for re-election. Uh, but we see the same kinds of threats being made and now at a different level. And clearly one of the things that happened is the desire to use that fuel of anger to propel into political prominence that was then supposed to be followed by will then co-opt them and they will follow along with what we as leaders want to achieve greater goals. The co-opters have become the co-optees. And the fact is it may be a small faction, but it is a dominant faction of radicals, not conservatives, who now run the Republican Party. And maybe Sarah Binder has done a terrific job of pointing out uh, the different factions within the House Republican Party. Maybe you've got 40 who are absolutely true believers who will not do anything that their leaders want because they don't trust their own leaders. And then you've got another 40 who might on occasion bend just a tiny bit. And then you've got about 150 or so who are in the middle, and then you've got about 20 to 40 who uh, want to be loyal to the leaders. The fact is the 150 will do whatever the 40 or the 80 want because they're scared to death both of primaries or of being shunned by the dominant forces in the party. And it is Rush Limbaugh uh, and Sean Hannity and Mark Levin and local talk radio hosts and those who run blogs along with Heritage Action and the Club for Growth and this new dominant figure in Ted Cruz who are driving this entire process. They are not conservative. They are radical. And how we move beyond that and when you get into a situation where a couple of apostates from this point of view, like Peter King, stand up and say, this is madness, but I've got 25 of our members who are ready to go to the floor and keep the government running, and then gets six votes and looks behind him and find that they have all run over to the other side, it tells you what the obstacles are. So what do we do? Just very quickly, and I will only give an outline, we want to do a whole series of things, and it better be done relatively quickly, that will enlarge the electorate and at least move away from having this inordinate power of a small faction of the most regular primary voters and caucus goers who tend to be the most uh, uh, ideologically driven and move to a broader electorate. We have all kinds of ways we'd like to see done. If we could wave a magic wand, would be the Australian system of mandatory attendance at the polls. But at least if we could move more towards open primaries with preference voting, it could make a significant uh, difference. And if we can find other ways to make voting easier instead of making it harder or suppressing votes, we could encourage a larger electorate more generally. Uh, working outside matters and finding somehow a way to ameliorate the role of tribal media will make a real difference. And as Jim alluded to, we also need to find ways, and maybe it's through aggressive use of public shame, as we have tried to do, 
to make sure that a mainstream press, under enormous economic siege itself, not able to find business models, fearful of being labeled as biased, and that might mean you lose advertisers, even as you lose readers, have taken on the refuge of it's everybody's fault and do it reflexively, which means accountability here. The notion that you appoint blame where it belongs disappears entirely. And if you don't have accountability and you don't have people who can address these issues for those who don't follow it on a day-to-day -day basis, then we're in even bigger trouble. Lots of things we'd like to do inside, things that Tom and Jim and I have worked on for 40 years in improving the process. We'd love to recreate the regular order. And it was actually stunning yesterday to see that Bob Walker, who was a leading uh, radical in his day in the House of Representatives, but a real aficionado of the floor and an understanding, lamented the fact that the regular order has disappeared under both parties. There you may find a few allies. But the fact is you could bring back the regular order, you could do many of these other things until you change the driving forces in the society, until you can alter a dynamic where the culture leads us in a tribal direction. We're going to fight an uphill battle and the real danger here is that if we don't begin to make some changes as this tribalism is metastasized from Washington out to many states and now is really starting to take hold more in the country as a whole. Uh, that we really will have to run for our lives. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, since Norm stood, I might as well, huh, Jim? It's um, always difficult <laughs> to follow Norm. I'm sorry, I should have called on you first. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Norm. Jim, thank you. Uh, I'm always delighted to return to AU in the, in the center. Uh, Norm and I were up at Princeton yesterday, we gave a talk at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and I began by noting the perfect timing of a talk on our book on the first day of the government shutdown. I said, that just didn't happen on its own. Uh, Norman and I had to do some serious work to produce that, and, and, and uh, uh, just apropos of what Jim just said about Norm, I said, we actually stealthily gave stupid pills to Ted Cruz and John Boehner, at which point Norm blurted out, and they were pl placebos. <laughs> well, we're having, I think many of us are having second thoughts about American exceptionalism. Uh, uh, it's something our politicians love to trumpet. It, uh, it's something many of us feel in parts and ways. We, uh, we are grateful for being citizens of this country, and, and we know it's, uh, it's great strengths, but, but it's, it's, its governing process and its politics is, is really now a source of uh, uh, embarrassment uh, around the world. Uh, it's a serious threat to our economy, but I would argue, and we've been arguing for a long time, it's a, it's a serious threat to our constitutional democracy. Uh, Norman and I, for at least two years, have been trying to help Tom Friedman see the world as it exists instead as, of as he wanted to. And here this week, uh, like... Two days ago, right, Norm? We, I read, I proceeded after the first paragraph, you know, I was encouraged. I read the whole column, and I smiled, I nodded, I almost cheered, and I said, by God, he's got the word. He understands what's... But he didn't quote you. Well, that's okay. He doesn't <laughs> like us selling books. <laughs> um, it, it, it really is the case, and I don't think any of us should be complacent and our frankly our professional posture is as political scientists is to say it's okay it's all right um, we've been through tough times before people get all excited but we have you know 230 years of of history and in which we've gotten through some tough times I say oh you mean like the 
terrible polarization before the Civil War. Uh, yeah, we got through it uh, uh, at, uh, at some extraordinary uh, cost. It, and the political science uh, literature is still filled with, uh, um, with those who say, just calm down, relax, look at the unique adaptive forces that might be Mo Fiorino or even, even Dave Mayhew, uh, you know, my hero and just an extraordinary academic who, who knows American history much better than any of us, uh, but who's instinct too is to is to question those who uh, who seem to have uh, a sense of concern about them uh, it it really is different and and that was the point of our writing the book we've spent decades uh, defending Congress trying to explain it it's not supposed to look good it's supposed to look awful uh, in the course of getting something done gridlock can be a good thing we know all those things, but this is of a different sort. And it's a, of a different sort because the norms, uh, and I don't mean Ornstein, uh, the, the norms of democratic practice uh, and small r Republican government in this country are, are being ignored, if not shredded. Uh, and the fact is, just having elections is not enough to make a healthy democracy work. Uh, uh, and right now, some pathologies have developed in our, in our politics. What I, what I want to begin by saying is it didn't all happen with Barack Obama's election or the year later with the formation of the Tea Party. This is not simply a uh, a three or four or five year story. It's been developing over decades. The roots are, are deep, uh, uh, planted uh, starting really in the 60s. The first, and Norm alluded to this, is uh, uh, we have an unusual, and certainly it was unusual at the time of the framing, constitutional system. Of, uh, of separation of powers, of, uh, of separate elections, uh, of midterm elections, of, uh, of requirements of agreement across chambers and institutions in order to get the fundamental work of the institution done. And if uh, it's also a constitution that while built on the idea of majority rule, it, it protects minority rights. Uh, and it makes us especially vulnerable to insurgent attacks uh, uh, that would undo the norms and expectations of, uh, of the system. Right now, a good number of Republicans uh, simply don't accept the legitimacy of the Democratic Party and its president, uh, Barack Obama. They're foreign, not just being born in Kenya, but whose, whose politics are of a sort that isn't faithful to the framers of the Constitution uh, and to, uh, to our country. Uh, uh, when you have a constitutional system like this, and when the parties which developed immediately after the Constitution, though not mentioned uh, in it, take on a distinctive character of being internally homogeneous and, and distant from one another, uh, you, you really run into uh, the possibility of serious efforts to undermine uh, governance more, uh, more broadly. As our parties have become more parliamentary-like, uh, we see how ill fitted they are within our separation of powers constitutional system. So this goes back a long way. It's not just now. It's not just the Republican Party. The problems initially emerged in some respects on the Democratic side. But what was different before is that the, the, the parties themselves were divided. And so you didn't have the whole apparatus of, of party coinciding with ideology and 
strategic interest in the team winning, not just individual politicians winning. Because when the team wins, you control power and then, and then are in a position to get something done. Uh, you know, midterm elections alone would undermine any notion of accountability uh, given the polarized system. We, we routinely change party control of one or both houses of Congress after a, a presidential victory and set up divided government. Now, with different norms and with cross-cutting cleavages, you can, you can make that system work. But the cleavages now are all reinforcing. Interest groups that pick one side uh, or the other. So too has the partisan media and the, and the social media, the funding uh, 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 systems that have been developed on, uh, on both sides. And it makes it exceedingly difficult for, for our system of government to work under these conditions. So it would be problematic had Obama not been elected president, the first black president, or if the Tea Party had not formed uh, out of the, really, the distress over the financial meltdown and, and recession and perception that the big guys at the top and the undeserving, irresponsible people at the bottom were, were both letting us down and taking the hard-earned resources of, uh, of middle class Americans. Uh, so that's one key part of, uh, uh, of this problem. But the second, and this is the one that political scientists and reporters and goo goo uh, budget reduction groups like Fix the Debt and Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, uh, well meaning people have all fallen prey to, which is if we accuse, if we describe the reality that exists, um, <laughs> Uh, then they will see us as aligned with the other side and others will see us as having a partisan bias. So we have to speak in generic terms about the problem of partisan polarization. They're both implicated. It's both sides. We just need to bring them together and compromise. It is a formula for inaction and, and disaster, not a solution uh, to the problems that confront the country. Democrats went through a tough period uh, sort of ideologically and culturally in the 60s and 70s leading into the 80s, lost a lot of presidential elections, uh, got their act together uh, in an interesting way, and since then have won the, won the popular uh, uh, vote. Uh, uh, in uh, five of the last six elections. Uh, uh, in one of those years, they didn't make it to the White House, but it's been a pretty strong presidential, uh, presidential coalitions. But the most quoted uh, sentence in this book is, goes something like, uh, the Republican Party has become an insurgent outlier, ideologically extreme, contemptuous of the inherited social and policy regime, going back to Roosevelt, and by that I mean Teddy, not FDR, uh, scornful of compromise, uh, uh, simply finding uh, the whole idea of facts, evidence, and science as unpersuasive, and dismissive of the legitimacy of its political opposition. That's quite an indictment, but, but the fact is that that is what has transpired. So when we talk about fixing it, Jim, uh, uh, and this reinforces something that Jim said, that Norm said, I mean, the basic problem is the misfit within our political system, our parties and our governing institutions. Um, you know, we're the longest lived uh, presidential system of, uh, of democracy, but you look for others and all you can find is Chile. Um, the, the fact is presidential systems have not done as well as parliamentary systems uh, around the globe. Uh, and they're, they're prone to these kind of problems, not just gridlock, but, uh, but really a, a, a 
public giving up and turning to the man or woman on the white horse. Uh, in many other countries, it's led to dictatorships. I, I don't want to suggest that's coming our way, but I, I, I simply want to tell you it's a, it's, a, it's a big, big problem. Now, yes, the, if we have to live within this present system, we're certainly not going to alter the Constitution and adopt a parliamentary system. We've, we've got to improve the fit. Uh, we can try to change the party's system, you know, less ideologically polarized uh, uh, parties uh, to begin with, something that retains a choice uh, for the electorate and a means for elected officials to act to deliver on, uh, uh, on their mandates, whatever they are, we need something um, that will ease the, the fervor, the zealotry, the true believer nature of our party systems. And, and in the book, we propose, as Norm suggested, relying heavily on the idea of increased uh, political participation. And we have lots of ideas, including some fairly uh, ambitious one like compulsory attendance at the polls, Australian style. The other, the other strategy is, well, if we're going to have parties like this, let's try to adapt the institution so majorities can occasionally get something done. That's easier said than done. I mean, if it's a unified party government and you change the filibuster rule, okay, but you're just as likely to ha have a divided party government as we do now, and that would make not a bit of uh, difference in the whole process. Nonetheless, there are, there are things that can be done. In, in short, we urge these, as far as thinking about them and thinking about our system more broadly instead of just the hubris of exceptionalism, but we really believe the route to uh, dealing with our dysfunction is to bring the Republican Party back into the mainstream. Uh, not as a moderate party, a conservative party, but a party that accepts realities, that believes in facts, that, uh, uh, that has a respect for its opposition and for contrary ideas and believes in the whole notion of deliberation, uh, of bargaining, and of, of compromise. Now, that's a great suggestion. Uh, so how do we do it? Well, we're getting help right now. Uh, what's going on in Washington today is forcing a lot of elites, business executives, of journalists, of, uh, of uh, even ordinary citizens to say, what is that party up to and what are they threatening? It, it goes to the idea of public shame. Uh, as an element in trying to bring the party back in. But I want to suggest um, two other things that will be important to this. The dynamic of how this plays out will be extremely important uh, in terms of whether we are able to improve uh, the functioning of our of our democracy and, uh, and of our governance. One is um, uh, the mobilization of the business community, uh, who have been so myopic uh, about their interest, uh, holding out for the special little advantage where they can have access, uh, and thinking about Republicans <laughs> wanting to keep marginal rates low, and they have high salaries, instead of thinking about economic stability, financial stability, growth, <laughs> investments and in infrastructure and job training and uh, research and development. Uh, uh, I mean, Fix the Debt has spent millions of dollars, and what do they do? They send letters to offices. We want both parties to come together and compromise. Well, there's an interesting idea. Gee, thanks. Thanks for that. But terrified about identifying one side or another. Politicians are politicians. They, they have incentives, they see opportunities and constraints, you know, they, fear is what's necessary. And, and so I think in addition to a mobilization dealing with the problem now, which is primarily a problem of the Republican Party, 
Um, uh, I think instead of bemoaning super PACs, uh, uh, we, ought to, we ought to see counter super PACs encouraged to develop uh, and enter Republican primaries uh, in defense of Republican officials who actually think compromise is a noble uh, uh, activity and was assumed by the framers as, as the glue that kept the whole system together. So we may have to start a little more hardball politics, real politic, utilizing uh, uh, the opportunities that exist now, many of which we'd rather not see, the, the role of big money in, uh, in politics and the rest. But I think that's going to be essential. Uh, that could be done in time for the 2014 elections to prove um, if the Republicans don't uh, change their way uh, to make majority control competitive, and a, which would be historically unique, picking up 17 seats given them the fact that a Democrat is in the White House uh, and given the fact that there are few seats out there that uh, Republicans hold that Obama actually carried. But it's not impossible. It, uh, it's called a wave election, which we never see on behalf of a, of a president. But in this case, if anger builds and, and clarity develops, it, uh, it could happen. In the longer term, and I'll end with this, it, one has to hope that those Republicans who care about their national brand, uh, who aspire to have their party win presidential elections and actually govern in an affirmative sense, have to realize that they're on the short end of a whole host of demographic changes and uh, without changing their ways in, a, in a, a very significant way, they will only get to the White House by virtue of being out of office when the economy collapses. Uh, they won't be a serious uh, uh, major party in our politics. And one hopes that those now caught in the echo chambers of their safe congressional districts are challenged by others, including those running for the Senate who are governors to, uh, to aspire to something uh, uh, more noble uh, and ultimately more successful. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. We're going to open it up to the audience for questions, but first I have a question. Um, in 1860, just before the Civil War, we had a distribution of, of uh, votes in the House and the Senate of uh, common vote analysis, which we have, which is, is the same as today. I'm surprised, I'm shocked that you didn't talk about uh, redistricting reform trying to bring more competition in the general election, which the theory is that if you have that, you'll have more people coming to the middle, and you'd get more people, therefore, willing to work with each other. The, the blue dogs are basically gone. Uh, moderate Republicans are, it's a dirty word, they're gone. Uh, Tom and I served on a little group for several years trying to push for commissions to do it, like in California. And we've gone from one or two districts competitive out of 53 to about 10 this last election. What is your position on redistricting reform and whether it would make a difference in terms of the way the House looks? Well, I'll start. Um, we are for redistricting reform. It's uh, the, the first question almost uh, always that we get is about redistricting, and it's become now such an enormous focus. I saw when Bill Clinton uh, was interviewed and talking about uh, by Piers Morgan and talking about um, the pathologies in our politics, he started with redistricting reform as well. Boy, do I wish that we could uh, somehow uh, do redistricting reform and fix our politics. But the idea that it's a panacea is simply false. Um, it's, it's a problem. Uh, but let's face it, uh, it's not uh, uh, the nature of districts that got Bob Bennett, uh, whose by voting record was one of the five most conservative members of the Senate, uh, uh, into a position where activists blocked him from even being able to run for renomination uh, in a primary. 
Uh, it's not a redistricting reform that knocked off Lisa Murkowski uh, in a primary in Alaska, or redistricting, I should say, or gerrymandering, or that caused um, uh, Arlen Specter to leave the Republican Party because he knew he couldn't win uh, a, a, a renomination. There are larger forces at work here. It is true that the nature of the districts does make House members safe and makes the challenge much, much greater in a primary uh, in most instances than a general election. It is true that districts are more and more homogeneous, and because of the nature of tribal media, they're becoming homogeneous echo chambers. So members do not represent different kinds of groups. They don't even feel a fiduciary responsibility to do so. And if you look in particular at the South, which is the driving force of the Republican Party now, it's the dominant force, uh, the vast majority of those districts are pretty close to lily white. Um, and it, it wasn't always that way. You used to have even conservative Republicans like Bob Livingston in Louisiana who had 15 or 20 percent African Americans in his district, and he paid attention to them. He didn't want to alienate them at least. That's gone now. But the fact is we have sorted ourselves out uh, into like-minded groups, and the nature of residential patterns makes redistricting reform, if you follow other principles like continuity, compactness of districts, contiguity, communities of interest, you're going to end up with Democrats concentrated in uh, cities, and you're not going to create more heterogeneity now. It's a bigger problem than that. So. I'm happy to work night and day on changing the system here, but until the culture changes, it's not going to uh, have more than a uh, probably a positive marginal impact. Let me just to add a footnote or two to that. Uh, uh, scholars have looked at this uh, in every possible way, and the general consensus is that the growth of safe seats in the House and in state legislative uh, districts, uh, where they're even safer than in Washington, are due primarily to factors other than redistricting. Uh, remember, uh, uh, if, you, if you really want partisan gerrymanders, you're willing to put a few seats more at risk, make them a little more competitive because you can spread your supporters more efficiently instead of putting them into 80, 20 uh, districts as many Democrats are in urban areas because of the natural geographic distribution. Uh, partisan redistricting is more a consequence than a cause of, uh, of polarization, but it reinforces it now. Uh, because the parties are operating at parity and they're willing to manipulate any electoral rules to, uh, to keep their power or to help achieve it. And that really does diminish our democracy. And that's why Norm and I really do favor some effort to uh, de-politicize, de to remove the ability of partisan manipulation from Washington and state uh, 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 redistricting uh, uh, systems. So that would, that would be a good thing. The Republican Party has an advantage right now, uh, and they're enjoying it, and we saw the result in the last election. Democrats had over a million more votes for, uh, uh, for the House, uh, but Romney, uh, actually won uh, more congressional districts than Obama, uh, even though Obama had a 4 percent, roughly 3.9 percent uh, advantage in, in the popular vote. It, it has to do with the nature of the distribution of Democrats and Republicans and the last round of redistricting, where the most assessments had the GOP gain at sort of seven to 10 seats. Uh, so it's not just that, it's a piece of it ought to be addressed with, but don't start there, just have it on your list. Thank you very much. Uh, now that you've taken your pharmaceuticals and you can get through all this material, um, let's open up to questions. Yes, Ken. Uh, Ken Watkins, Chairman of the Academy, Sustainable Communities. Dwight, great to see you again. 
Um, he was a speaker a couple months ago at our academy. One quick um, anecdote. When I first came into the Senate as a staffer, the Senator Hayden um, said, well, uh, I want you to be the uh, uh, staff director of the subcommittee on standing rules. And the only thing you have to do is to go up there in the afternoon and make sure that uh, Rule 22 has not changed. <laughs> <laughs> Since then, I've been on the other side, uh, working with Brookings and others. And right. one of these days, maybe, it's just one small piece of the puzzle. The question I have uh, is a very small one to ask both of you and, and Jim. And that's uh, on page 148 of, of the book. You, you, you talk about <clears throat> the open primary and the closed primary. And as, as uh, one um, possible um, amelioration that could happen. And I guess what I'm a little confused as is where uh, does that definition stand with regard to um, uh, convention versus caucus, for example, in, in, the, in that classification. And particularly, um, as we come toward 2016, where we already are, how um, uh, Obama actually changed the rules, as you know, in, um, uh, without the Clinton people understanding that, uh, by increasing the number of caucuses that were going to happen in the Democratic Party in, in, in 2008. And um, I happened to be working with the Hillary people, so it was a big surprise at that time. And uh, she was counting a lot on the super uh, delegate vote, which... Right. <laughs> which was uh, held hostage once the caucus uh, strategy held out. Question is, specifically, what would you do today from different standpoints, um, your, your, your perspective uh, or your platform from the media, um, gyms, or within the party itself, and also obviously on the Republican side, but but – Speaking of the Obama strategy, how would you change that now? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> two levels to consider this. Your examples are, are really from the presidential primaries and caucuses, the nomination process there, while uh, what we were talking about with the open primaries was uh, in the Congress and uh, the efforts there to – to try to mobilize a larger electorate uh, that uh, and create incentives for candidates who were not operating at the absolute extreme pole of their party to actually participate in the process. Uh, by the way, the initial experience in California, it's limited. Uh, it, it coincided with the new redistricting, so it's hard to read it, but it's not real encouraging. Uh, this is not going to lead to sweeping change and, and the growth of moderates in, uh, in the House because you've changed the, the primary rules. Uh, Tom, would you say that was true in Washington State also because they had this runoff primary thing? Yeah, yeah the, the Seth Maskett has sort of looked at both of them, and, and his feeling is, listen, there's tidbits of uh, – things to take away as encouragement, but in, in general, it doesn't seem to be doing, uh, doing much. On the, on the presidential side, it's a, it's, it's a story that developed over time. It used to be that party conventions on their own with delegates who were state party officials chose the, chose the president, uh, presidential candidates. Uh, then in the progressive era, we sampled uh, with primaries and started the primary process. Uh, over time, uh, some states got a little discouraged by that, uh, reinstituted caucuses, but now they were open caucuses, and so not the old pros running them, but people who were really excited about uh, issues and and the idea was primaries would actually be an improvement on caucuses because it's more easy to manipulate the smaller caucuses than, than it, is, uh, it is a primary. But now in the system, the way it's developed with the sophisticated presidential campaigns uh, with, with tens of millions of dollars to spend, they're going to work whatever the rules are. Iowa may be a caucus state, but it's a primary state. Uh, they'll they'll work it as intensively as 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 the others. I suppose if I I were to choose, I'd choose primaries um, over over caucuses. But Hillary could have won those caucuses had 
had she paid any attention to them and made made uh, the investment. I don't think. Uh, I don't think that kind of structural reform, that is to say, I think George Will uh, in this morning's paper and the Post was, you know, was, was just dreaming about how to change a party. Uh, it's, 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 it's really going to take formidable mobilization of those who feel otherwise uh, from the present party and candidates who who have appeal uh, to begin to change the mix of forces and, I, and ideas. And I think we can tinker with the system, but it's not going to make a big difference. Let, let me elaborate uh, uh, on a couple of things. Um, uh, the first is in the latter point. You know, George Will, like so many others, is sort of grasping for some solution um, while ignoring the fundamental problem. And uh, if you take a look at the uh, uh, surveys that Ron Rappaport and William and Mary and his colleagues have done of uh, a huge number, uh, I think 11,000 members of Freedom Works, which is a pretty good um, uh, uh, way to boil down the Tea Party movement. Um, and what you find with the post-2012 survey is two things. One that reinforces uh, his 2011 survey the majority of these people have disdain for the Republican Party. They're not partisans, which means they don't much care about winning elections as much as others do. Um, they're driven by ideological forces. Uh, they are populists. They can't stand their own leaders, much less uh, others. But the second in the 2012 election is they are convinced that Mitt Romney lost because he was too moderate. Um, and so. Uh, you can change these rules around a lot, but if the driving forces out there, the people who turn out in caucuses and primaries, believe that if only we pick the pure candidate, then uh, Ted Cruz is saying yes, uh, because that will be uh, very positive for him. On that larger point about the open primaries, um, there are a couple of things to say that uh, I take you know just slight issue with what Tom said. One is. Anybody who expected that you could institute open primaries and in one or two experiences suddenly miraculous things would happen and only moderates would flood in are dreaming. That's not the way it's going to work. Two, there is a real need to combine it with preference voting. So you can avoid having multiple candidates come into a race, divvy up the votes, and allow somebody with a narrow plurality to win, which means an extreme candidate could win. and you want to avoid a situation such as we had in one congressional district in California, which was an overwhelmingly Democratic district, where there were a dozen Democratic candidates who split up all of those votes, two Republican candidates who won the pluralities, and the choice that voters had in the fall was two Republicans. So there's a way of avoiding that. But I would make the larger point. My desire to have open primaries uh, and with preference voting is much more because I want to provide protection for incumbents who look to compromise, who fear a primary challenge from the base, well-funded, who have much greater protection against that happening if it's an open primary. And that's why we also want to see more efforts like what Steve Lauderette is doing with the Main Street Coalition of Republicans, which is raising a big fund so that if the Club for Growth or Heritage Action or uh, the Koch brothers directly come in with a primary challenge to somebody who's tried to be a responsible legislator, they will pony up money to counter that. And it's going to take a lot more than the $8 million or so that Steve has raised, but we need to find other ways to counter the impact of big money, which is becoming more and more tribal and ideological. Let's go over here, right here. Uh, first off, well, well, uh, first off, let me say uh, that uh, the book was fantastic. If you haven't got a chance to read it, it's great. Uh, you stated in the book that uh, ultimately could it comes you repeat down. That? <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> we For the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, but you stated in the book that ultimately it comes down to the public to uh, to, to to really push a lot of these uh, a lot of these yeah. changes and and really fix things. What type of event do you do you, uh, I guess, envision whenever you say that that would help the public to 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 change their ideas and and to really understand what's going on? Would it be an event like what would take place like on this. October seventeenth, or 
I mean, it just seems like it would have to be some sort of really huge shift to, to just click people back into the reality that things need to change and that, you know, sure. one particular side happens to be kind of the catalyst behind all these problems that we're facing. That's a reasonable uh, question and an insightful one. The reality is that Americans believe they have more important things to do with their lives uh, and their communities and neighborhoods and children and, and workplaces uh, that is higher on the list of priorities than educating themselves in great detail. And many people who have the motivation have already made their minds up and they're just selecting media that reinforces uh, their views. Uh, I guess what we were appealing to is, uh, uh, is the electorate that is still susceptible. One who, not the 40% who don't vote, although that may change over time, but uh, uh, those, those who do but still have the capacity, uh, if confronted with arguments they hadn't heard that had some credibility, would uh, lead them to think about it. It's one of the reasons why we put such an emphasis on the mainstream press getting the story right, not because they, in effect, demobilize the public because their message is, ah, it's the whole system, it's Congress, they're all involved. What the hell can you do then? There's no way out of it. It, it, it seems to me more nuanced reporting, and obviously it's not just the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and there's so little press coverage at the local levels, especially on TV, where they get uh, those people get what information they do, but it's it's got to be built into groups caring about this, and 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 schools and uh, leaders uh, within within communities to. Uh, but the event is what's going on now. That is the nothing can capture the attention and get people to think twice as seeing something look disastrous and getting a sense of, hey, there, one side is saying, you know, we're going to, we're willing to pull the trigger on the, on the U.S. and global economy if Obamacare is not, is not uh, eliminated or seriously uh, weakened. I Early public opinion suggests that that's not a real popular stance, and if reinforced, uh, Republicans may begin to hear that and uh, act differently. You know, so, I, I, just a second, behind his question, if I might push it, and then we'll get to you, know, is the question of how you improve civil discourse, which you assert that needs to be done in civic education and everything uh, related to getting people to be involved in, in the discussion. And it's not all the media's fault uh, having a bias there or having echo chambers. There are other things that you talk about, and uh, Tom, you may want to elaborate on that a little bit before Norm, or Norm, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'm in, in, the, in the here and now, I'm, I'm sort of <coughs> less concerned with civil discourse than, than civic understanding and knowledge of what's going oh, on. Oh, shut the hell up. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, you know, I don't mind some rough and tumble uh, language if uh, it actually helps people understand uh, something. So the, the focus there really is, is on improving knowledge. Listen, compulsory voting, Jim, if we did it like the Australians do it, uh, and it's only attendance at the polls and the fine is ten or fifteen dollars, and you can send a letter saying, you know, my kitten was sick, and I had to uh, uh, take her to the vet, or 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 whatever. But what it's done is it's built into the schools a a process of uh, of of education, of learning how you vote and where you vote, and and what sources of information there are. And it, uh, an expectation builds about what it means to be an Australian. And you take on a, a sense of responsibility and a whole lot of people come in who aren't 
mad as hell at everybody and and are prepared to sort of listen to reasonable arguments. And your registration moves with you when you move. It's easy. Absolutely. I'm sorry. The you know it's all it's all part of the continuum of efforts of 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 making it. Uh, uh, making it easier and increasing the motivations for for more widespread participation and the whole redistricting system is a part of that. Uh, let me address both of those uh, first. Uh, one, I'm, I am concerned about uh, the state of civil discourse because it's been coarsened dramatically. And the fact is we now live in a society where you can say the most vile and awful things and there is not even a sense of shame or much less a consequence that comes with it. So when you have an Ann Coulter who goes on Sean Hannity's show and says that Barack Obama is a monkey for Vladimir Putin, um, and she's on the next night or the next night, and it's all kind of shrugged away. If you end up uh, using racist terms and you get away with it, you demonize a president or you demonize others, that makes the tribalism much, much worse. And it makes it much harder because then you're asking people to compromise with those who are the enemy, not the adversaries. So it is a bigger problem, I think. Um, and uh, it's hard to do something about it, but we have to do something about it. On the question of events, certainly uh, you hope that we can make uh, chicken salad out of uh, uh, what's going on now. And there's a small silver lining, perhaps, which is most Americans who have no clue what government does and think it doesn't really affect their daily lives are starting to see many of the areas that do affect their lives. And we're seeing a, a smattering of incidents. I saw uh, that the other day Randy Neugebauer, a congressman from Texas, went to a national park and was blocked by a ranger who had been deemed essential from going in and started, said to the ranger, aren't you ashamed of yourself? And he said, I'm not ashamed. And then Nugabar was surrounded by a bunch of constituents saying, get off your ass and open up these parks again. You're the ones who are closing them down. That we're starting to see, and of course, all of those people who run restaurants and hotels and uh, outfitters in and outside the parks are realizing that if the government doesn't keep the parks open, their livelihoods go away. And when you start to see that meat is coming off the shelves because we can't do the regular meat inspections, uh, then people will start to have a different attitude, maybe. But the fact is, if we want to look at events that can change things, it's elections that change things. And you need to lose a bunch of elections in a row to have the pragmatists among you gain enough spine that they stand up and do more than just say, oh, this is awful, and then shrink back, but really look for the fundamental survival. Usually, you've got to lose three presidential elections in a row, at least, before you begin to think that it's not just the idiosyncrasies of the individual candidates, but something deeper. That's what brought Democrats back in 1992 with a more centrist nominee, the head of the Democratic Leadership Council, Bill Clinton. Uh, and it might make a real difference in 2016. One of the things that uh, makes me more sleepless at night is, and uh, Jim was just showing me the latest CBS uh, uh, news survey, which basically uh, has Republicans who don't particularly want to compromise, but independents and Democrats do, but they want both sides to compromise. So that fix the debt uh, theme, which is a right. foolish one, is out there. And if this really falls apart, including the debt limit being breached, and we get serious economic turmoil. You can imagine the larger public reaction being, screw you all, and then the Democrats could lose the Senate. And if that happens, and Republicans, because they have these advantages in the House, hold on, even if they lose seats, what's the lesson learned from that? Hey, this worked. Double down on it. So that's in part also, getting back to what Tom said, where you need to have a mainstream press that's not partisan, but that points out the realities of what's going on here. And one of the things that's happening that it may be providing more encouragement is that there is a natural tendency in the mainstream press, they love to report divisions and difficulties. And so it's a, now it's a Republican Party civil war, and you're getting Pete King standing up and saying wild things, and he can have every television uh, appearance that he wants, and you're getting Ted Cruz who can go on television whenever he wants, 
And so that sense of internal turmoil is causing them to inch a little bit closer to saying, hey, they're holding the government hostage here. In this case, it's one party that's more at fault. But if you don't get more of that, not because you want these guys to lose, but because it reflects the reality, then voters who don't pay attention on a regular basis aren't going to know where to uh, uh, establish and distribute uh, the uh, uh, appropriate accountability. And then we could end up in worse shape. Let's go right here. Um, I'm from Washington, D.C., but I'm living in the South now. So oftentimes people will say, if you go in the back room, Fox News is on, and we don't want to see it. And so I'm, I'm used to hearing that in the South. But um, one thing that occurs is that the pundits on these MSNBC or Fox or whatever are paid. They're on the staff, and so they all want to get on, and that's their, that's their format. But it's, it would occur that we need uh, the, the white, if you say they're white leaders in, the, in these districts, um, prominent Americans in business and labor that could come forward in some kind of a, a forum quickly, quickly, and not just one coming out of the White House at a time and facing a microphone. But um, I can't think of maybe a head of Starbucks, different Google, different people saying, this is a Republican issue, and we, we've studied it, and we, we need to confront it. Um, that would be something that would be a news event that they'd have to cover. <laughs> Thank you. No, I agree. Uh, uh, it's so much easier to cover someone else saying something yes. than to exactly. do it yourself. But if they're leaders, leaders oh, exactly. they would know. Yeah, and absolutely. Get it going even this week. I mean, on the <laughs> Mark. Thank you, Jim. Uh, you know, I, as you know, I used to work in. Uh, campaigns uh, in the early 90s, over 100 <coughs> congressional districts around the country. and You also worked in my center. Uh, uh, yes. Appreciated that. <laughs> uh, graduate here. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to go back on a structural question. You know, one thing that I feel like always gets overlooked is, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan overturning the Fairness Doctrine in 1987 and sort of the beginning of talk radio, uh, the beginning of a structural problem with the media where uh, you didn't have to present both sides, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and the development of that echo chamber that you talk about. And I'm not sure I know what the solution is to that I, uh, at this point, but, you know, it seems like the party leaders who in the old days, if you had, uh, for those of you who remember a Helen Chenoweth after the 1994 election, the leadership would have made sure she never appeared on television because they didn't want her to be the face of the Republican Party. Um, and now, of course, the media flocks to Rand Paul and Cruz and, and Michelle Bachman and others. And, uh, and, and this leadership seems to just cede that over to the, the most radical parts of their party. And, and so I, I just wonder what, it, I, I, I actually own your book, although I admit I have not read it uh, <laughs> yet, uh, but I. Uh, Did I, you buy it? You know, <laughs> I, I have it. I actually have it at home. Uh, but, uh, and too busy because of all this uh, craziness to, to, to read it. But I, uh, uh, having been a political scientist myself, I think that, that the, uh, you know, the, the structural issues, unless they're addressed structurally, like having civil discourse, Americans having civil discourse, I mean, let's face it, they're, they're, they're getting squeezed, they're, uh, you know, the rich are getting richer, the middle class is getting squeezed, and, and they don't have time to think about this because of, of the impact of what's happening on them. And so I'm just sort of putting out there is how do you get, you know, a, a leadership of a party to actually, um, lead uh, th their party and, and what could be the incentives for, for them to do that other than keeping their position? Now, there, there are a couple of questions embodied in that. On the latter front, uh, we lament not just the decline of the problem-solving caucus, the people whose primary goal in coming into public service is to solve problems, but the institutional caucus. The number of people who care about their own institution, who will work to try and make it work better, who really do care about things like the regular order. It's just far less than it was 20, 30, even 10 years ago. Um, and that's a real uh, problem. But in the larger issue that you raise first, we're not going back to a fairness doctrine. And the fact is that the mass media, as the technology has changed, has changed dramatically. You have 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of outlets now, uh, and they're amplified by social media. And what are you going to do in a world where the business models are such that Fox News, with an average audience at any given time of two and a half million people, can make far more in net profits than all three network news divisions with an audience of 30 million combined? Uh, and how does Fox News get that two and a half million? By having a consistent tribal message that people want to hear over and over and over again. And MSNBC was on the trash heap uh, for its uh, owner, General Electric, until they adopted a <coughs> watered down version of the same model. They're now coming a little sharper, but they're now more valuable than NBC for the same kinds of reasons. And I don't know how you get around that. What we suggest is if you can find a way to get funding, and one idea is to, uh, never mind the public interest obligations of broadcasters, and the broadcast stations now are cash cows because of the post-Citizens United world with all the political money coming in, get them to pay rent for the public airwaves and put that into a fund used not exclusively but mainly by public media to create a public square again, a place where you can have reasonable civil discourse. And you're not going to get 100 million people. You may not even get the 2.5 million, but you can begin to alter that framework. And then we've got to get opinion leaders to jump up and shame the people who violate all this. But I'll tell you, you know, if you look at the emails and, uh, and responses that Tom and I get, because you can do this stuff anonymously now especially, people will say the most incredibly awful things. And that's true of public figures. Uh, Pete King was saying the other day that, you know, when he stood up and said Ted Cruz is, you know, crazy, he's driving our party off the edge, he, he's been radicalized because he started to get these threats and these terrible things said to him all coming from Ted Cruz supporters. If you can do that under the cover of anonymity, and then you watch television and people who are not anonymous, the Ann Coulters of the world, say just as awful things and get their lecture fees increased, uh, that's a real hard uh, obstacle to overcome. Just uh, uh, again, a, f a footnote, your question really went to why can't the leadership do something about it? They. Uh, because the press doesn't recognize them as the channel through which they get access to party members. I mean, every party operation, uh, Jim knows this as well as anybody, is, has set up very elaborate uh, message units and communications operations, and they're trying very hard to do that. But when, you know, the, the press... I mean, Rand Paul and Ted Cruz, they're very inviting targets. They make, they attract, first of all, they attract to regular media um, uh, people who, who usually only watch their partisan media, and they're out to make a buck. God, it's depressing. <laughs> very depressing. Let's go back here. But realists. Hi, I'm <clears throat> Brian Forrest in the School of Public Affairs. I want to first thank you for the great public service you guys are doing uh, to hear you on, on uh, Diane Rehm yesterday and elsewhere is just, is just very reassuring. Um, my question is, uh, as the Republican Party becomes increasingly extreme, it would seem that there's an opportunity for the moderates to reform as an independent Entity and uh, the more and the more extreme they become, the greater this vacuum and the greater the opportunity. Could you speak to the possibility of a third party as possibly a solution to this could problem? I, could I add to that by asking about the uh, dealignment of voters in America moving from the Republican Party to this thing called independence, not a party, but you know. Okay. Well, and, and you know, the I think uh, at this point the response to Jim's question is it hasn't really happened yet. Um, you know, you still see if you begin to parse voters out uh, that uh, you've got roughly a third of Americans who identify as Democrats and a third as Republicans and a third as Independents, but the third who identify as Independents still include a third each who lean to the Democrats, the Republicans. And they behave very little differently from the partisans. And we have to Ken Candy Nelson. Candy Nelson. Yes. <laughs> yes. As a book. On exactly. This topic. Um, and I have seen no evidence, and Candy 
can elaborate on this, that that's changing. Having said that, anecdotally, we sure know an awful lot of people who have been lifelong and self-identified Republicans or lean Republican who have a lot of cognitive dissonance right now and who are appalled at what's going on. But they don't want to move to the Democratic side, and they don't at this point want to form an independent party. And there are still people out there who have this fantasy of the uh, knight in shining armor riding through in an independent wave to protect us. The problem is we don't have the capacity in our political system, given the structural and legal impediments, to a third party developing and really moving in. At some point, you could see some other force supplanting the Republican Party as the Republican Party supplanted the Whigs, but not a third party developing. And one of the nightmares that we could have, actually, is that you could have some successful independent presidential candidate who could do well enough that it would throw the election into the House of Representatives. And, you know, God help us if that's where we end up. Uh, but, you know, I could envision a scenario where uh, Democrats, uh, partly in reaction to what they see on the other side next time, nominate a candidate who's pretty starkly over on the left. And the Republicans nominate a Rand Paul or a Ted Cruz. And a Mike Bloomberg or somebody else emerging and running as an independent and getting a third of the votes and getting a significant enough share of electoral votes, not that you could win. And if you could win, you'd have another nightmare that you exist in a political system where you have how many people who are adherents of yours in the House and Senate? Zero. Uh, but otherwise, you divide the electoral votes and throw it into the House where they vote by state. So uh, I don't wish for an independent party. I do not wish for a new uh, revival of America, Americans elect or any of those forces. Uh, we need to try and find a way to channel this constructively through what will continue to be for better or worse, and at this point for worse, a two-party system. Yeah. Just go in the back back here, please. Uh, Lou Wilson from the School of Communication. Um, keep it simple. Any hope for a new generation of young Republicans to see more of the realities of what's happening in American politics? It, and are they all libertarians and we're, we have to give up? Uh, there's always hope with the younger uh, citizens of this country. And the well, in fact, one of the last <laughs> sentences of your book, this edition right. says, there's hope through the young people, through women, through Latinos and yeah. others, yeah. right? The millennial generation is, uh, is diverse. Uh, their instincts on, on social policy matters are, are very libertarian. Um, some are, find the economic libertarianism and the um, libertarian view of uh, let's stay home uh, and not engage internationally in, in uh, trying to provide global security. Uh, so some people will find that appealing, but I'd say a plurality of the generation actually believes in government and wants it to work. The problem for them is uh, before this financial crisis that, you know, that was sort of their feeling. Now so many have suffered uh, economically. Uh, failure to get a job or a good job that puts them on a, on a track to success has led to some uh, discontent about the efficacy of, of government initiatives. So it really is a question of, uh, of whether they engage enough to analyze what's going on and to try to involve themselves in a way that could make a difference. I have no doubt that we can fix our, our problems. Uh, uh, Tyler Cohen is, uh, Bill Galston had a piece in yesterday's Wall Street Journal. It was, it was the scariest thing I'd ever read. Uh, uh, Tyler Cohen, an economist and public intellectual at George Mason, says inequality is here to stay. And what we're basically going to have are 10% of people who are living really well, like, like us, uh, but as well as the 0.1%. And hey, I'm an academic. You can <laughs> <laughs> And 90% uh, 
you know, who just aren't going to make it, and they're going to be scrambling and uh, suboptimal. Uh, and he said, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, I mean, that's appalling. Of course there's something we can, uh, we can do about it. There, there are no qu sort of quick fixes, but we have enormous strengths uh, in this country. All the while, this chaos was going on with the financial crisis and economic recession. We, we intervened. We took steps. The last President Bush did the right thing at the end of his term. Democrats bailed him out in the Congress to get the stabilization program going. In a few years, we've become the world's largest producer of uh, energy which changes the whole global economic and strategic uh, situation. We are still the land of entrepreneurs, uh, people desperate to come to this country to start their businesses. Um, we know what we have to do with our infrastructure and our education and our training systems and our, and our research and, uh, and it's just a question of, of uh, you know, helping enough people to create enough uh, uh, energy to send different kinds of people to Washington uh, who, will, who will set aside the Ayn Rand uh, uh, or its left equivalent, uh, uh, which we don't hear much about except from very conservatives, drop these utopian notions which historically have been disastrous. Uh, Karl Popper, The Open Society and Its Enemies, uh, is the book to read on that. And to go with our strength, which is, you know, we're pretty pragmatic people here. We can do. We fix it. We get it done. We're open-minded. <coughs> we're community-oriented as well as insistent on individual freedoms. We... Uh, we can turn this around. Right, yeah, right here. And then. Uh, Otto Hetzel, professor of law. I just, I guess I was a little bit uh, discouraged when I came in here. You haven't contributed much in terms of uh, to the positive feeling. I do, I do think, I heard Judy Woodruff the other day doing exactly what you described. I was curious as to how you got Tom Friedman turned around because, in fact, that's what, unless that something like that happens, I don't see us heading except for a real disaster in the next three weeks. Now, maybe you've got some positive elements. I'd be love to hear them. Um, well, uh, you know, I think it, it took some effort, and we were a part of it, to get Tom uh, away from his uh, uh, previous uh, mindset. Uh, you know, uh, there are at least some reasonable outcomes over the next three weeks, but frankly, uh, it's hard not to be very, very uneasy. Uh, I think the threat of default is just much, much greater than it was the last time. John Boehner reportedly today uh, told his caucus that he won't allow default, that if necessary he'll bring something to the floor um, and rely on Democratic votes. We'll see if that happens, and we'll see if what he brings to the floor is in fact a simple clean extension uh, of the, the debt ceiling. Um, and for what length of time, because it could mean that we get back into the same jag in a month or two or three or four. Um, I wrote a piece in the New Republic a week or so ago suggesting a way out, and I, I, it was reinforced for me this morning when a, a conservative Republican congressman basically said, um, you know, we need something, some face-saving thing. I don't know what it is. Just give us a bone so we can get out of the box canyon that we're in. Um, and uh, there's a point to that. If you're going to reach an agreement here, not by compromising on the basics, there is no way, I believe, that Barack Obama <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> can give in either on a threat to shut down the government uh, in return for hostages being released, or worse, the debt limit, without creating a nightmare of immense proportions further down the road. But what's out there is the longer-term solution to the debt limit problem, taking it off the table permanently, and that is the McConnell rule, which uh, McConnell devised in 2011 to get us out of this, which is you, in effect, let the president unilaterally raise the debt limit. Congress can uh, disapprove it, 
but he can veto that, and in effect, it would take two-thirds of both houses of Congress uh, to override that veto. If he can get that, then you can do some horse trading. And that horse trading could mean um, any of a number of things. You could give up on the medical device tax in return for another source of revenue. You could give up on the employer mandate, which nobody really wanted in the first place, or at least the administration didn't. Uh, you could give them a little malpractice reform. You could give them uh, a commitment to another intensive session, uh, set of sessions with Paul Ryan and others to come up with a long-term debt problem. You could uh, commit to tax reform. There are a bunch of things that you could do there that aren't giving up anything fundamental, not because you're increasing the debt limit by three months, six months, or a year, but taking it off the table. So that's one way uh, out of this. And it would be a positive thing if you could make that happen. But what I fear is you're not going to reach that point until after they breach the debt limit and that uh, Boehner may not follow through on what he is uh, now saying. And if he does, that it won't be for a, a, a solution that gets us out of this nightmare. Let me just uh, follow up a bit. It's such an important uh, uh, question. The worst thing uh, other than a... a a public default uh, uh, would be, uh, with or without that, would be a, uh, the first of a series of uh, short-term extensions of the CR and uh, increases in the debt ceiling. That's why it's absolutely critical for the President to maintain the position he's taken for some time. You don't compromise. Uh, under threat of extortion uh, with the country and the, the whole world being held hostage. Under those circumstances, you don't. But you promise to engage in any kind of negotiations they want after these two problems are, uh, are set aside. And so disabling the debt ceiling is of the highest priority. One solution is, uh, is the one Norm mentioned. Uh, it's nice because uh, McConnell actually framed it initially. The other is just to do away with it. No other, one other major country has a, uh, is it Denmark or? Yeah, Australia does. Too. Yeah, Australia uh, has it. As we learned that from Julia yeah. last week, uh, has it, but it's never been politicized at all. But just get rid of it. It has no, it's like an appendix. It has no useful purpose uh, anymore. Just cut it out and we'll all be uh, better as a consequence. And if that were part of, uh, you know, the deal, then you could imagine uh, a de-escalation uh, in slowing down the train headed for a wreck and then begin to, to, to build uh, uh, from there. But it's, it's, it's got to be of that order, and the president has to be prepared uh, to default, although I think in the end, if Republicans are crazy enough uh, to let it go forward, that he should exercise what I consider to be his, his Article Two powers to see that the laws are faithfully executed and confronting three sets of mutually exclusive uh, laws, uh, laws governing, governing spending, taxing, and the debt ceiling, he decides the first two take precedence over the third and basically declares the, the debt ceiling null and void uh, and prepares for the, the impeachment efforts in the House but uh, and a possible challenge uh, or overriding by the Supreme Court. But he would be beloved by the country and the world for having taken the initiative. So that's there as the final fail safe if uh, if all else so Tom and Norm what do you think of this thesis that's out there about uh, Boehner's strategy of going with the radicals on the CR and the continuation of the CR not a clean CR and then when it really comes to the debt uh, limit uh, debate he has more power to go ahead and do what's right you know, I, I think the idea that Boehner has a strategy here is... <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Uh, I like to sit, Norm. Just <laughs> way too generous. The idea that he has a set of tactical moves is pushing the envelope here. I think this is a day-to-day -day, uh, thing. You know, Boehner has survived 
by just trying to s go day by day and fend off uh, his Rottweilers each day by giving them a little more raw meat and hoping that that will satisfy them. And it was, uh, oh my God, if we shut down the government with a threat to defund Obamacare, that's a political disaster. We can't let that happen. So I'll tell them, don't do that because we've got the debt limit for leverage. And now we're in the worst of both possible uh, worlds because we've shut down the government and uh, the idea that that has satiated them or will, now of course his move is, all right, well let's try and limit it to two and a half weeks because on, by October 17th we can combine that with the threat to uh, default and the president will cave. Um, and if the president doesn't cave, then we've got a real problem. Now, if I had to guess what went on in that meeting yesterday at the White House that lasted for more than an hour, my guess is it was dominated by Jack Lew, the Secretary of the Treasury who was also in a dominant position in the Clinton administration when we had the last threat of default, telling them what the consequences would be in the starkest terms uh, for the economy now and in the future designed to scare the living daylights out of them. And that Boehner's statement today is a reflection of that and a realization that we're not just playing with fire here, we're playing with atomic weapons. But he has no control over his own caucus. And frankly, one of the things that disturbed me a lot was talking to a reporter yesterday about a profile he was doing of Peter King and somebody who follows him closely, who said that King has now been pretty much ostracized by Boehner. That when Boehner met with his loyalist caucus in different groups yesterday, King wasn't invited. And the fact is, you can get the Louis Gohmerts and the Michelle Bachmans uh, and the Paul Bruns out there excoriating the speaker and saying the wildest things and nothing happens to them. But somebody on the other side, he just wants to keep them quiet, uh, basically. And that tells me that he is a prisoner away from among forces here and I hope I'm wrong and I'm hoping that in the end that he will uh, bite that bullet and bring up something to save the country from catastrophe, even though it will weaken him immensely. I don't think it costs him the speakership, by the way, because if you look at it, if they decide 50 members hold a caucus and vote him out, uh, they've got to have a vote on the floor and get 218 votes for a new speaker. Um, if 20 Republicans, and by the way, if they do that, they're not going to go to an Eric Cantor or uh, a uh, uh, Kevin McCarthy. They're going to go for somebody who will do what they really want, uh, <laughs> Jeb Henserling or a Tom Price uh, or somebody in that uh, uh, category. And you might get 25 Republicans who decide to vote for Boehner or uh, not to vote. And you could have a prolonged period on the floor where there is no speaker. And at that point, you could also imagine Boehner going to Nancy Pelosi and saying, tell you what, you guys vote for me, and uh, we can do some work together. Um, uh, you know, a lot of things could happen. But uh, if, if he doesn't uh, give up the notion that he's got to just run ahead of his crazies to stay in charge so he can keep the perks of the speakership, then I don't see a strategy here that's leading us in a positive direction. Norm, that was very good, but you've insulted the Rottweiler breed in your answer. And, and, I, and I've, heard, I've already heard, I just got an email from the head of the Rottweiler Association <laughs> right saying he's there. upset. One last question. Hi, I'm Denise Barron, <clears throat> excuse me, a political scientist. I'm in the early stages of developing a center on political parties and democratic development. What I was really hoping to see you do is extend your analysis into party organizations. You've mentioned extreme candidates as one problem. You've mentioned tribalism and ideological activists as another problem. And from an organizational standpoint, those are very different animals. One is <clears throat> a uh, recruitment problem. Another one is mass public problem. And I'm kind of curious because if you look at political parties, there's been a lot of downsizing of ideological activists from the <clears throat> redu reduction to a three-day convention uh, to the Democratic Party uh, DNC becoming permanently authorized and 88 adopting the rule that they could uh, review and change any rules adopted at the convention. 
Um, <clears throat> neither party has had a platform committee hearing since 1992. And in 2012, the Republican Party passed a lot of rules changes at the convention, which really increased the power of the RNC and downsized the power of the states to control it. And I'm wondering, you know, <clears throat> if you could extend your analysis and kind of talk about those two twin problems of leadership recruitment, extreme candidates versus <clears throat> ideological activists. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's important to recognize how different parties are today. Uh, one uh, is there, they've been even more important in Congress in, in, uh, uh, in fundraising and candidate recruitment. The, the party campaign committees in the House and Senate are now real players in that game. Set aside the presidential uh, side of, uh, of the party. Uh, uh, so, and even, the outside groups are, for the most part, extensions of the parties rather than uh, uh, competitors with them. Most of the super PACs are run by former party officials or administrative officials. Seth Maskett and others have introduced the notion of party network as a, a much more useful term than party organization in these uh, in these times, that they exist far beyond uh, the formal uh, members, elected leaders of the Republican and Democratic parties. The, uh, as I said, we've lost the cross-cutting cleavages. Uh, now donors are on one side or another. Interest groups are on one side or another. Uh, uh, the staffers, the campaign uh, consultants, it's all it's all part of a, uh, a large team of, uh, of players and, and actually complicates uh, uh, the role of governing because I think it really increases the, the tendency toward extremism. Uh, 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 and because, because of the deep involvement of uh, the other parties, but, de but, Parties are sort of here to stay. The, the people who are attracted to run are motivated by what they see going on in our politics rather than who, who sort of touches them on the shoulder. It's true the campaign committees are out there trying to find plausible nominees uh, uh, to compete in seats that are actually up for, uh, for grabs, but it's... Uh, it's a, it's a much broader situation. And on the presidential side, I think it's, uh, it's driven by individuals. And, but in the end, it's the party network people who are validating candidacies, uh, who are steering resources. Uh, but the ideas are dominant, I think, in all of this. Ideas and interest uh, more than organization. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming.